If you've been struggling to make money trading so far in 2022, it would be hard to blame you. A perfect storm has been unleashed since January, one that has combined the worst features of the most recent bear markets. And judging by the resolve of the Fed to keep tightening its monetary policy in spite of the economic chaos, it increasingly looks like as a trader, you're gonna have to not only trade a bear market, but an all-out controlled demolition of our western economies. So in this video, we're going to identify why the micro surrounding this meltdown makes it not your regular bear. We'll review 5 ways to position your algorithmic portfolio for both defense and offense, and I will give you a bonus take on a little advertised development with an SEC ruling that I am sure you will love to know about. Let's go. To start with, it is important to identify that inflation is the justification for the current rate hiking cycle. I said the justification, not the catalyst. The difference is crucial because unlike a catalyst, a justification is rhetorical and can be artificially managed to not go away until the intended goal has been reached. To understand why this nuance is so important to navigate the current bear, we have to understand the beginning and the end of the ongoing plot. If the injection of trillions of tax dollars into big corporations under the alibi of stimulus checks for the average Joe was certainly a factor, today's reported inflation spike is mostly a supply-side problem, one that was caused by nothing but the orchestrated destruction of worldwide supply chains by governments across the world under the COVID narrative. So it should not come as a surprise that when the Fed claims to address inflation using a tool aimed at taming the demand side of the equation, you know that the intention is not to quell the problem, but rather to entertain it long enough for it to provide the justification to achieve an ulterior motive. That ulterior motive being to create a recession deep enough to justify introducing their new financial system. This is best identified by studying the game plan now openly disclosed by Bolshevik think tanks such as the World Economic Forum and how central banks are to be instrumental in unrolling their dystopian communist plan. Achieving digital slavery through CBDCs requires creating sufficient individual economic dependence on the state by destroying any means of independent livelihood. This multi-purpose strategy achieved the goals of causing massive economic distress for most small businesses that were deemed non-essential, as well as that of clearing the competitive landscape to increase the centralization of economic powers into the hands of large corporate entities that are much easier to coerce into implementing mass surveillance, financial censorship, and economic control as a whole. Now this breeding ground for CBDCs has been set. Justifying their introduction within the planned time frame of 2024 to 2025 requires creating enough financial distress by unraveling the debt-based house of cards that Western economies rely on and destroying their pension system, while at the same time maintaining the faith and confidence in your own fiat currency. That's a tight rope to walk on, but that's exactly what the Fed is dead focused on doing at the moment. Once you realize that, you understand that the Fed will not be swayed by volatility to come to the rescue of the market this time, and that the so-called Fed put will likely not come back until after CBDCs have been introduced. This is the likeliest scenario today since CBDCs are by design meant to create not just permanent inflation like the debt-based dollar was, but individually programmable inflation in order to enforce compliance and negate any semblance of individual wealth building. Think Chinese-style social score, individual carbon credits, and expiring currencies if you want to get a taste of how bad it can get. In this context, the Fed's threat is to be taken very seriously. Think of the fact that the US equity market's secular positive drift was mainly due to corporate value creation, stock buybacks, and inflation. With the first two catalysts likely reduced to a trickle in the coming month, I am expecting the market's negative bias and higher volatility to continue until at least mid-2023 and the engineered distress caused by phony wars or the food and energy crisis justified by these so-called green policies and the climate change scam will only accelerate this process of controlled demolition. It is important to realize here that no matter how insanely absurd political decisions appear today, they are not due to your politician's incompetency. Rather, we need to accept that these are very carefully calculated, deliberate, and incremental steps taken to advance this agenda of total control, depopulation, and enslavement. All of which you can, by the way, verify for yourself by simply reading the books and supposed visionary white papers published and rubbed in your face by those parasitic psychopaths who aspire to be in charge. And in case you're still wondering how this is even possible, I made this video, most probably the most important one since I started this channel, where I explain not only the how, but the why of everything that is unfolding, link in the top right of your screen. But now let's move on from our 10,000 foot overview of the situation and let's see what the math tells us. 
The least that can be said is that the quantitative evidence is in agreement with this fundamental backdrop. The effects physics algorithms are all telling a very similar story. As you can tell from our quant heat map, the alpha system allocation reveals itself to be as risk averse a positioning as it gets, with 100% of equity allocated to cash, an extreme that was reached in late June. This bias is actually scarier than the risk averse setup seen during former bear markets though, including the most acute meltdowns such as that of 2008. Why? Because this time, it shows that opportunities to decorrelate are essentially non-existent. You see, for how brutal it was, the subprime crisis at least allowed some heavy decorrelation by rotating assets from equities to high quality corporate bonds and US treasuries. This not only allowed to offset equity trading losses, but when done correctly, it also allowed to end the year sometimes well in profit. None of that is possible in today's bear market, because this one also combines volatility with a key feature of the 2015 bear market, which is the strengthening dollar that has been acting as a wrecking ball bursting through just about every single asset, leaving nowhere to hide besides some short-term moves in commodities, as well as higher frequency trading using daily or intraday strategies. As for strategic decorrelation, which is the most efficient way to achieve risk management in trading, the opportunities have been and continue to be few and far between. Sector diversification worked for a while with commodities, but has now completely eroded thanks to the erratic price changes triggered by those whimsical political sanctions against Russia. Still, it does not mean that you should remain a sitting duck. And here are the five quantitative escape doors that I have been using to survive the storm this year. The first one is obvious. Letting your algorithms naturally increase their cash position to an insane level is most likely the solution of choice at the moment if you have nothing better in your trading arsenal to be on the offensive. Second, I have been bolstering the short logic in my equity trading suite of systems. For example, I just brought an upgrade to ES Prodigy last week that will lower its reliance on the rising equity bias and allow it to take further advantage of sudden market breakdowns. Third, even though discretionary trades are a big no-no in quantitative trading, there is an exception to the rule, one that still is derived from objective criteria. Assuming that your replication quality for the year has been good, then you should have built in a slight outperformance in your trading account over your theoretical algorithmic targets. What you can do with this reserve is spend it towards a long-term long put option to further buffer your portfolio for volatility. Of course, it goes without saying that you should not try to speculatively time the market with it. Doing so with long options is a statistical recipe for disaster. The game plan here is rather to purchase an add-the-money put with as long an expiry as possible and let it expire where it may. I repeat, the goal with this trade is not to become a speculative money maker before maturity, but rather to let it run its course and enjoy the hedge while it lasts. I was able to protect 25% of my portfolio for over two years that way, essentially for free from an algorithmic standpoint. The fourth countermeasure that I've put in place is more sophisticated. It is to use tactical algorithmic decorrelation by treating a portfolio of decorrelated assets such as Bitcoin, precious metals, or hard and soft commodities. As you can see, Alchemy, which I'm still developing and tentatively upgraded into its final form in June, has been totally oblivious to the cratering stock market ever since. And fifth and last solution, I've been digging for some deeply asymmetrical reward to risk trades. Picking up far-fetched option trades for pennies on the dollar is a long shot of course, but it needs to be done with a view to take advantage of those still unquantified tail risks of sudden market dislocations. These types of moves were typically what we saw last year with oil going negative, or more recently the British pound getting ravaged to multi-decade lows against the dollar following the disastrous economic decisions of Liz Truss, another corrupt World Economic Forum puppet. Looking forward, that strategy would take the form of buying far out the money call options on fertilizer producing companies, for example, or directly on grain in order to anticipate the shutdown of BASF and the engineered famine next year. Doing the same with gold and silver or Bitcoin would also make sense, all of which are vehicles now valued to an absurd discount when put up against the future need for uncensorable means of transaction once the cashless society comes online. I think you get the idea. We're living in extreme times where rug pulls are about to trigger the realization of terror risk in various compartments of the economy, and these seemingly insignificant bets today could turn out to pay handsomely if you understand where the globalist mafia intends to drag the world. Remember, you are the carbon that they want to bring to net zero by 2030. So for those few discretionary positions that you take, keep that plan in the back of your mind and trade accordingly. 
no matter what. You need to remain aware that your objective during this time should not be to do miracles or revenge trade your way into profit. Your mission is to keep generating abnormal risk-adjusted returns, with abnormal being defined as improving upon what a passive buy and hold of your most representative index would offer you. And actually, generating a negative return for this year could be deemed successful too. Here is an example. Portfolio Trader Pro has generated both higher return and lower risk than the S&P 500 since its inception. Does it make money every single year? Almost, but no. And it is likely not going to this year. But this is not the issue though. This system is meant to be an improvement upon five star Morningstar mutual funds, and the mission has been more than accomplished for the past six years now. As long as you generate abnormal risk adjusted returns, you will be fine in the long run. What you need to remember is that bull markets are meant to grow rich, meaning in nominal terms, as in you should see your account equity grow. But in times like today, your goal should be to grow wealthier meaning to increase your purchasing power by dropping less than the market. If you happen to trade an unleveraged strategy like Portfolio Trader Pro and you happen to be down 10% when the index drops by over 20%, then your mission has been accomplished. Because even if your account equity went down, you can buy more of the S&P index today than you did at the start of the year. I also would like you to not lose track of the fact that bear markets are also made of fantastic rebounds in between. And even though the market looks to be on the verge of total collapse today with everybody and his brother calling for it, you need to remain alert of those quantitative clues that might show peak bearishness, at least to catch those short-term reversals. For example, at the moment, the six-month pairwise correlation in the S&P 500 have topped a full standard deviation above average, at level not seen since the crash of late 2018. Likewise, the small option trader's put call ratio has spiked to a new year-to-date high to net bearish. And lastly, the portion of stocks within the S&P 500 that are down by 20% or more from their all-time highs has already reached the average that corresponded with the previous bear market troughs. So even when everything seems headed for a crash, do not succumb to fear and never lose track of your quantitative inputs. Ignoring them could lock you out of tremendous opportunities like the massive rebound that unfolded last summer. Turning to cryptocurrencies now, the crypto compass reveals a very quiet landscape after the debacle of the first and second quarter. The recent sideways price evolution has seen some very interesting developments though, with the general crypto market decoupling from equity volatility and finally reclaiming a personality of its own. The most recent downside correlation has dropped to a significant low during equity sell-offs while benefiting from equity rebounds. This asymmetry clearly shows that we have entered the fourth phase of the crypto bear market, which is that of capitulation despair and accumulation. While I'm not expecting anything major in the coming weeks volatility-wise, either up or down, I am considering the upcoming market phase to be a protracted period of lull, purposely catering to accumulation, similar to the 2018-2019 to doldrums. So if you're looking to quietly build your positions over the next few weeks and months without having to suffer wild gyrations, then this could be your chance. Now in this week's infamous fine print section, I would like to draw your attention to a decision that largely went under the radar last week. And this is not by chance. I really want to dedicate this decision to those of you who still believe that regulators are here to protect you. Well, as you will see in a second, not really. Regulators are merely there to facilitate government agendas and protect private monopolies to play ball with the state. You know, the so-called lobbyists. If you watch this video that I purposely made a priority to publish in series one of our trading education series, I warned new traders back then about how your free brokerage such as Robin Hood is anything but free. Rather, such schemes are a scam since these so-called free brokerages sell your order book to HFT firms who then front run your orders and shave off fractions of pennies of retail traders' transactions thousands of times a day. That practice is called payment for order flow, often referred to under the acronym of PFOF. The fact that the SEC was going to go after these shenanigans was very suspicious to me from the start since, as I just said, investor protection is the last thing that these criminal organizations are worried about. The excuse of investor protection has always been nothing but an alibi for more control of our individual property and more overreach on free market competition to defend the banking cartel. This is why, for example, the CFTC retrospectively admitted to engineering the Bitcoin market crash by forcing the introduction of cash settled futures back in December 2017, and why the SEC is now so concerned about regulating the crypto market and proof of stake protocols because God forbid, you would be able to control and self-custody your own assets like a sovereign being. 
By going after payment for out of flow, Gary Gensler was literally going after such names as Vio2 and Citadel. It was too good to be true and as it turned out, it was. This dude made a radical choice for your actual safety. A choice that delighted his protected bodies as you can see. But one that still won't keep the SEC from claiming in the future that their mission is to protect investors and keep the equitable functional order of financial markets. What this non-decision means for you, as I have repeated it multiple times, is that only you can keep yourself safe by investing time and effort in your own education from unbiased sources. I cannot encourage you enough to go through our training curriculum and get the required knowledge to at least stop falling for the same scams over and over. It's all free. So what's your excuse? With that, I think that'll do it for this episode, folks. Markets are exceptionally tough right now. And even as a veteran who's been in this business for almost two decades now, I can confirm that it is the case. And there is no shame in just barely surviving the chaos around. Capital preservation should be your priority number one. And if the solutions that I laid out seem too complicated to implement at your level, then this is fine. Do what you're comfortable with. But whatever you do, do not over leverage or take risks that you do not understand thoroughly. Treat smart out there. I'll talk to you in the next video.